so much for being here today as we highlight Sexual Violence and Abuse Awareness Week, which unfortunately happens far too often and is on the rise. In fact, in 2023, the member organizations of the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence received a total of 23,300 calls and provided in-person assistance to almost 8,500 survivors of domestic and sexual violence. It's up to all of us to ensure that survivors have access to the resources they need to recover and move forward, while also holding those who commit these terrible crimes accountable. I first want to thank the network and all their incredible partners for the work they do every single day to support Vermonters who have been on the receiving end of violence and abuse. Your dedication to our friends, family members, and neighbors is inspiring. I also want to thank the Treasurer and M&T Bank for their partnership with the network on this initiative you'll hear about in a few minutes, which will help survivors with financial empowerment. Because studies have shown that economic instability is one of the primary barriers preventing victims of domestic and sexual violence from leaving the situation they find themselves in. Our work to address the crisis of domestic and sexual violence cannot stop until it's no longer needed. And I'm proud to stand here today with so many who have made them, that mission their life's work, along with their allies. With that, I'll turn it over to Karen Tronsgaard Scott, the Executive Director of the Vermont Network. Thank you so much, Governor. Good morning. I'm Karen Tronsgaard Scott. I work at the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence, where I'm the Executive Director. Thank you, Governor Scott. Treasurer Pichek and our partners at M&T Bank for your leadership. You know, last summer on one of the few sunny, hot days of the summer, Treasurer Pichek came over to the network office and after just a few minutes of conversation about the economic toll that domestic violence places on survivors and on Vermont's families, he said, you know, I think we can do something. I've got these friends at M&T Bank, and, and it's amazing to me that here we are today ready to, to kick off this incredible initiative. We're here and thrilled today to announce this important partnership between the Vermont Treasurer's Office, the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence, and M&T Bank to address financial abuse. This new initiative will utilize financial empowerment training and credit building opportunities to enhance opportunities for survivors of violence to heal and recover in the wake of abuse and ultimately to thrive. The financial toll of domestic and sexual violence is immense. At the network, we estimate that our state spends over $100 million uh, a year responding to domestic violence, and this includes the costs associated with the response from law enforcement, corrections, medical, and social services. But by far the most profound cost of domestic violence is on victims and survivors of themselves. In just a few minutes, you'll hear directly from a domestic violence advocate who will speak to the impacts that financial abuse has on the daily lives of survivors in our communities. One of the things that sets this partnership apart is the collaboration between the nonprofit world, the business world, and the public sector. Uh, we're coming together to address, to address this issue because we recognize that the reality is that domestic violence affects each and every one of us. And we know that this is one meaningful way to address the cost of violence in our communities. And we're really thrilled and grateful to be a part of this partnership and initiative. And now I want to introduce to you Ari Menard, who's an advocate from Circle Vermont right here in Washington County. Ari. Good afternoon. My name is Ari. I am the shelter coordinator for Circle, which is Washington County's domestic violence agency. I hear many different stories of abuse on a daily basis, but there is one form of abuse that is the single biggest barrier to housing and to allowing survivors to move on with their life. And that is financial abuse. So financial abuse can look like many different things. Um, it might look like a partner saying you can't work or forcing someone to cash and then hand over their disability or their paycheck. It can look like someone counting the mileage on your car to make sure that you only went to the grocery store and then demanding the receipts when you return to account for every penny spent. It can also look like opening credit cards in someone else's name and then maxing them out, 
or forcing someone to co-sign on a loan or a debt. It can also look like more stereotypical forms of abuse, uh, verbal and physical abuse we might think of more commonly, that forces someone to flee their home and pay for places to stay temporarily until their own credit cards are maxed out. We call this the cost of survivorship. Most often I see the tangible effects of financial abuse in poor credit scores that in no way reflect the credit and the um, financial abilities of the person with that score. These credit scores haunt survivors as they seek housing or to apply for new financial products while they try to work to reassemble the pieces of their lives. I am an advocate, I am not a financial counselor, and yet I spend a great deal of my time teaching people about credit scores, secured loans, budgeting, and other forms of credit repair. These are pieces of financial literacy that I've had to teach myself. And I know from the survivors I work with that there's no way to budget your way out of poverty. When you're living in a shelter like the one that I run, with two kids under the age of three and no viable childcare options, and therefore no way to get and maintain a job, and your reach-up income is $735 a month to cover your rent and other living expenses, there's nothing extra to repair the damage of financial abuse. This is why I'm excited for this new program. Um, um, I'm excited that we're recognizing the harms and barriers faced by the people I work with. And programs such as this that address the financial toll of abuse and the impossibility of exiting poverty under conditions of oppression create a more equitable, just, and fair world for all. So now I'd like to introduce Heidi Stumpf from M&T Bank. Thank you, wow. I feel so fortunate to be here today to shine light on an important initiative and one that M&T Bank is honored to be part of. Thank you, Governor Scott and Treasurer Pichuk and your teams for bringing us all together. M&T Bank has a long history of providing support in the communities in which we serve. In 2023, we provided more than $1.5 million in community support throughout Vermont. Equally, or even more important, is our commitment to volunteerism. Our employees receive 40 hours of paid volunteer time each year to invest in areas in, that are important to them. Last year, Vermont employees provided over 6,200 hours of volunteer time across the state. Continuing with our pillars of giving, M&T Bank has pledged $100,000 over four years to the statewide partnership to bring financial literacy to a vulnerable group of Vermonters. Financial literacy is a critical piece for domestic and sexual violence survivors to regain independence. Additionally, our M&T employees, through their commitment to volunteerism, are poised to provide the critical training and one-on-one -on -one support through the 15 advocate agencies throughout Vermont. I can't tell you how rich and meaningful this work is, and I'm thrilled that M&T Bank can be part of it. I will now introduce Treasurer Mike Pichak. Thanks, Heidi. Uh, thank you, everybody, and thank you very much to the governor, uh, to Karen, to Ari, to Heidi. Thank you to the legislators who are here with us as well. Um, you know, the Treasurer's Office has a longstanding interest in financial literacy, uh, dating back to Treasurer Pierce and Treasurer Spaulding and Treasurer Douglas. And I myself, at the Department of Financial Regulation, when I was commissioner, had a great interest and spent a lot of time focused on financial literacy. Um, so when we sought to initiate our first financial literacy partnership since taking office, we really wanted to focus our advocacy efforts where they could yield uh, the most significant impacts. Uh, we wanted an actionable program that doesn't just focus on financial literacy, but also involves financial empowerment. And we wanted to do that with partners that um, we could work well with, who were well respected. And that's why I'm so excited to be here today, because this initiative ties together those three aims. Uh, as you've heard today, uh, financial dependency is a way for abusers to gain power over their partners. Financial reliance can be the main reason survivors are unable to leave an abusive partner or feel like they have no choice but to return to an abusive partner. 21% to 60% of domestic violence victims lose their jobs due to reasons stemming from abuse. So there is workplace insecurity. 85% of women leave an abusive relationship but end up returning to their abusive partner because of economic dependence on that individual. U.S. victims of domestic violence lose on average 8 million days of paid work each year, resulting in a total economic loss of over $8 billion annually across America. So it's a really important issue for us to focus on in terms of its economic impact 
the impact on the individual and the impact that it has on the community. It's also actionable. You heard from Heidi about how this will involve trainings throughout the state through the M&T network, uh, but the partnership will also include a financial match program uh, available to survivors. Uh, the match funds will be offered to participants to boost their savings as that individual is saving toward their own financial future. It's a designated to incentivize savings and enhance money management skills. There will also be a financial empowerment grant program associated with the program as well, both of which will be administered by the network. So as I mentioned, having great partners was a key to this program as well. Uh, we want to thank Kara Casey from the network for her work in putting together uh, the lead on this partnership for creating the proposal uh, and for the work that the network will do to operationalize it uh, and put it into action this year. I also want to thank m and Bank for their generous sponsorship. Uh, it's great to have a partner like that in our community. Uh, their commitment to financial equity and supporting the financial well-being of Vermont's most vulnerable is really important. And then I also want to call out the office of the uh, Massachusetts Treasurer who implemented a similar program with m and Bank in Massachusetts over the last few years. This was an opportunity for us to learn from partners within New England uh, to build on it and make it something unique for Vermont. And uh, for all those reasons, really excited to be here and make this announcement. And now I believe we'll have an opportunity for the governor to sign the proclamation. Any questions um, regarding the partnership would be happy to, to take. One, one thing that we heard earlier this year, there was a bill that was in the House about um, coercive and controlling behavior um, and about um, extreme risk protection orders and that type of thing. And one thing that we heard was that it's, it's challenging sometimes for survivors to come forward and actually seek either legal recourse or even ask for help. So I guess my question is, how confident are you, or how do you get people to reach out to MMT, to the state for this, this help? Well, it's really going to be critical, and I'll ask Ari to come up here in a, in a minute, because you know, none of us can do this independently of each other. The Treasurer's Office and MMT Bank would not be successful if we didn't include the networks. It's really the network, the relationships that they have throughout the state, the trust that they have within individuals that are victims of, of violence. That's the reason that it is successful. Um, and maybe Ari would want to touch a little bit more on that from, from her perspective. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, sorry, could you just repeat the question? I guess, uh, how, how do you get people to, to make, to reach out to you or to, to ask for, for help or admit that, hey, I, I need help with financial literacy or that type of thing? For sure. Um, so that is w one of the big problems with abuse is one of the techniques that's used is isolation. Um, in isolation, the abuser can create a world in which there's things that are okay that anyone outside of that world would say, hey, that's actually not okay. So we get a lot of calls from friends and family asking these types of questions, like how do I help someone leave a situation like this um, and seek help? And the reality is we, we just need to be there with a lot of love and compassion for our friends and family. One in three um, women is a survivor of domestic violence. Um, so there's a lot of people out there around us all the time who are in need of our, our support. And one of the big problems of abuse is that people are, someone is forcing someone else to do something. So we, in our work, do not want to force anyone to do anything. We don't want family members trying to force people to leave a relationship, for example, um, because the survivor is the one who knows the dangers very intimately, what, what that means. Uh, and it, it can cost, you know, up to your life to leave a relationship like this. So 
Um, all we can do is be visible, be present, and be caring and loving. At, at what stage in a survivor's journey do you think that a service like this is going to be most useful? So uh, in my work, I run the shelter for Circle. and. This is a stage where survivors are trying to restart their life and get into new housing, whether it's renting or maybe owning. I've never seen that yet um, because of the cost of financial abuse. That's the stage where this financial literacy piece comes in because people are coming to me with credit scores of 480. I am having to help them get those credit scores up to a place where a landlord might actually rent to them um, or a bank might ever consider giving them a loan for anything, you know, for a car or whatever else they might need to to get to a job. We live in a rural state, so transportation is really important. Um, so that, in my experience, is where I've seen this the most useful. But honestly, I think at, at, every, at any and every stage, we work with a lot of people on the phone, where sometimes we plan for two years for them to exit a relationship safely. And I can provide those pieces of financial literacy at that point as well to help them get their own bank account that's separate from their abuser. Um, get them to get their paychecks going to a different place uh, so that the abuser is not taking the paychecks from them. So really, I think at any stage, financial literacy training and services can be important and useful and helpful to a survivor, whether they're still in the relationship, just exiting, or trying to get back on their feet. Uh, either treasurer or the governor, is this, is this a public program that's being administered by the treasurer's office, or is this a private program that What's yeah, so it'll be a private program administered by the network. So the network will both administer um, the financial empowerment grants, the matching program, their administrative costs, um, and work with MNT to execute uh, on the training as well. MNT is providing the funding for uh, that operation at the network. So hundred thousand dollars is the that's how much money you all are going to have to work with to do this. That's right. Yeah, hundred thousand dollars over four years. It's incredibly generous. Um, do you mind? Sure, sure. Again, Karen? Uh, you characterize it as being incredibly generous. Mm -hmm. and this building, $100,000, um, seems like a very small amount of money uh, mm -hmm. comparatively. What, what can you really do with $25,000 a year? Well, $25,000 a year is, is not insignificant in our world. So this is going to allow us to do the financial literacy training. Uh, with our member organization, so it's important to know that there are 15 nonprofits in our state that uh, operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, meeting the needs of survivors of domestic and sexual violence. And those relationships, is, as Ari talked about, are they're, they're sacred relationships, I would characterize them as. They, they, these advocates are available to talk to people no matter where they are in, your, in their journey and no matter what is going on for them. So this will give us the opportunity to train those advocates to help folks uh, in addition to the work that they're already doing with them to help them have conversations about financial literacy and financial security. And then these, um, th this, this idea of match savings is also, um, I mean, you know, you're talking about scale here. So a match savings, how this works is that uh, a person will save an amount of money, say, every week, say $10 a week. And then what happens is with these grants, we can match that. So at the end of a period of time, they can come away with enough money for a deposit on, a, on an apartment or on a, on a car to pay off utility bills that are sitting outstanding left over from their abusive relationship. This also, <clears throat> another provision in this program is, is credit repair. So. Ari talked about the, the devastating impact of, um, of what happens to people's credit scores when they're abusive relationships. And they need to be able to repair their credit. And so, this, so the, without going too deep in the weeds, Pete, the, um, the, the system allows us to create uh, a situation where if they're, they're putting money into a savings, it's also repairing credit. So they're building higher credit scores, which then is, that's, you know, that's liberatory, that when you have credit, there's a lot of things you can do. And so $100,000 is a generous uh, amount for us, and, and we're looking forward to making that $100,000 have the biggest impact possible. And do you decide to get how much of that $100,000 will go toward the match program and what the maximum grant will be for an individual? I'm going to ask Kara to um, provide us with those details. I can send you a breakdown of the, of the budget. There's also a small grant program built into that. So um, one thing that we do at the network right now is we um, provide 
um, funding for folks that are moving um, either out of shelter or from an abusive um, household into a safe um, situation. And we are going to be able to kind of boost that and provide additional funds uh, for survivors with mini grants up to $500 um, for folks to be able to use for car repairs or education or housing. Um, and I, I can get you the budget that we, we put together. Thank you. And for those legislators in the room, they're always welcome to add more to that amount as well, right, Pete? <laughs> haven't. Um, we'll wait and see what happens in the Senate, and then I'm sure we'll find a way to, to get what we need out of it. Uh, Karen, in what way does the governor putting his signature on those words that substantively advance the interests of the people that you serve? Well, Governor Scott is the highest elected official in our state, and his the words that he spoke at the beginning of his remarks, the the understanding that he demonstrates about the incredible and terrible impact of domestic violence on citizens of Vermont speaks to his commitment to um, seeing all Vermonters, you know, all of us. And his support for this program and his support for survivors in general is incredibly meaningful because it helps us to not only pass and implement policies that benefit survivors and, and help us um, do things with people who cause harm that are, are that, that are meaningful, but it also sends a message to those very survivors that the highest elected official in our state believes in them, believes them, and is willing to take action to support them. So it's not a bad thing. It's a good. It's a really good thing, and we're very very grateful. Governor, I just had one more. I guess it gets back to a bigger public safety picture. I guess the attorney general just put out their domestic. Uh, I guess back to January, put out there domestic violence fatality review report, report showing it is down a little bit, but in years past, it's about 45-ish percent of, of um, homicides are related to domestic violence in Vermont. What role do you see a program like this, and and more broadly, just uh, addressing you know domestic violence? In what role do you see that playing in the bigger public safety picture? Well, I think um, having domestic violence and sexual abuse out in the public eye more and more, put in the, in the spotlight, is uh, very important. I think we've seen over the last number of years the escalation of uh, domestic violence in particular. And um, I'm very concerned about that. And part of it started with the pandemic. Uh, we saw that there was a lot of child abuse uh, in those situations. Uh, and we weren't able to identify it because kids weren't in school. Um, so that's why we thought it was so important to get kids back in school, back in the public eye. And so these types of situations, these types of products, anything we can do to sh shed a spotlight on this terrible act uh, is going to be beneficial uh, for those survivors. And uh, 
We need to put a stop to it, each and every one of us. This isn't a partisan issue. None of this should be. It's a, uh, it's a moral issue and something that we should, we should pay attention to. I'm not, you know, I'm not sure that there's anything to prevent that from happening. I, I'm sure that there's um, maybe uh, some action that can, take, can be taken after the fact, but that doesn't prevent it from happening. I think financial literacy in general, I think, is going to be helpful in that regard. Um, but, um, but I do think uh, that um, you know, the rating agencies and so forth, we should put our heads together to find out if there's a way uh, to rectify their credit scores uh, due to uh, this type of abuse. Any others? Yeah. The, I think part of the work here will be able to, if things are inappropriately on a credit score, to work through that, through the appropriate process to get the record you know, cleared up and, and, and firm. But another proposal that's in the Home Act would focus on um, having rental payments count toward your credit score. It's something that can count, but it's something you proactively have to do as a renter. So I think uh, Senator Ron Hinsdale is really interested in trying to create a pilot around that. We've been working with her on it, and I think that for a lot of people is their biggest payment that they're making every month. So to try to find a way for that to count toward their credit score um, I think would be a help across the board. Thank you all very much.